just start with this, which you already know. There's various things we want to know about differentiation, where invaders come from, whether there'll be natural rescue of endangered populations, whether there are adapted alleles adapted to conditions at particular places. And I see on builders presenting new methods. Well, these are the two methods, and they've both been around since the middle of last century and very intelligent. So um, we're going to be talking about what's new later on. And what a lot of the things that are new actually are really old. You just have to notice them. And um, I mentioned Shannon information on Monday. And then this is the differentiation between populations version of that mutual information. And this is another differentiation measure based on Bray Curtis, which the ecologists love. But it's got other names. The most recent one is this one in that paper. Um, the, and the suggestions of using them in genetics have been going on for a long time. Luantin suggested this one was aimed at the within location area we used for back in 1972, and he's a very famous evolutionary college, uh, geneticist. This one, people have been suggesting its use since the early 90s. Uh, Werner published a paper in oh, about six years ago, which, four years ago, which people suddenly noticed and started using it. Um, maybe the reluctance has been the absence of population genetic theories to say what they should look like with a given history of population size and dispersal, but I've provided that in that paper and um, summarised what I've provided in there, but there's been a bit more since. Um, and also this paper corrects something that Arthur hates. Um, this had a nasty asymmetry that it could it was limited by the um, allele that was most frequent out of the two populations. It couldn't get bigger than that, that value. And so this uh, also includes a correction that removes that problem. That one is removed in this one. Um, we'll talk later about, uh, as Arthur said, you can sometimes use bad methods if you have some that are methods that are bad distance measures if they've got good underlying theory, so you know what it's telling you about. Um, oh, that's what was being removed from um, the AA. The same problem that FST has, that um, it doesn't always give you the maximum value when there's maximum differentiation, which I told you about on Monday, so I won't talk about it anymore, and we'll just look at that. So just giving you a bit more about mutual information. People say, oh, this is mysterious. We don't understand it. Well, it's really, really simple. I think so. I will. And this has got very high mutual information. The allele that might crop up in an individual is very informative about what population it comes from. If it's got a B1 allele, not a B7, then it must be from population one in that scenario. So the mutual information is maximum between the allele identity and the population membership. Whereas in this one, knowing whether it's got B1 or B7 tells you nothing about population measurement, so membership, so there's zero mutual information. But that's, that's it, basically. Um, and one of, one of the first things we found this was good for, we've found some things it's rotten for, by the way, we're not totally wedded to it, but this, one of the things it's really good for is estimating dispersal. This was uh, what Claire Hollily claims is the most boring PhD that has ever been done anywhere, any time. Um, she had a room full of flies about the size of pairs of bottles and occasionally did some dispersal between them. And this is Roddy Duar, a physicist who did some of the maths for us. I always parasitise engineers, mathematicians, statisticians, and forget the helpers. Um, and they showed that high mutual information, know, knowing a lot about 
which population it came from, was associated, of course, with low dispersal. So the genes weren't being mixed and vice versa. And so there's an equation that says with a given eye you can work out what the dispersal is. And um, I think for some reason the next slide, yes. So we found that compared to everything else we looked at, mutual information outperforms all other dispersal measures from genetic data. And it had less, low bias and also low random error. And it was okay for a wide range of scenarios from things like invasives with a very large population and high dispersal to endangered things, small populations and low dispersal and all other combinations. Whereas FST is not bad at diagnosing dispersal but just within a very narrow range, extremely narrow range of dispersal um, below the level where ecologists care whether there's any dispersal happening or not. Whereas this is not like that. And then moving on to one of the other things that this person wanted, um, detecting loci under selection. Um, you'll, if you look through here, you'll see I'm using measures which are regarded as rotten. Here's AA, which Arthur hates because it's asymmetrical. Here's FST, which Nay, a very famous geneticist, told us not to use because it has that dependence on within location variation. Um, this one... These ones don't have either of those problems. That's just D, that's the mutual information I just talked about. <coughs> and it's worth using all of them. Um, that one, the I and the FST, are within the Hill family of measures that are mathematically related. Um, the Bray Curtis or AA is not closely related to those. The D is a bit different from those. Um, so, as Luciano said in his selection detection talk, whenever it was, yesterday, the day before, it's best to use multiple measures because you'll get much better diagnosis. And um, McVeigh, that person I mentioned before, forecast about 20 years ago that selection detection was going to have about a 90% false discovery rate. And then Schweitzer, that paper I showed you before on the wolves, said, yes, it's about 90%. So it's something to really, really worry about. Um, so I just tried using all of those, irrespective of what their problems might have been otherwise. And I did a simulation, so I knew which loci were under selection. And then I chose as the candidate loci that you would be pulling out in your selection detection as being in the top 1% of neutral values for genetic differentiation by one of that or that or that or that. And none of them did better than getting 45% of loci were true positive, or uh, false positive, the rest of them. But if you use paired measures, they're always much better. Not perfect, but much better. The best three pair pairs were that AA plus FST, both of which have their problems that I've talked about before, but between them, their problems seem to wash out and give quite good diagnosis. FST, another one with problems, and just D together gave very good diagnosis. What, what I was doing was saying, I'm only going to accept this as a candidate if it's in the top 1% for both of those measures, or both of those measures, or both of just D and mutual information. And that got us up to about two-thirds true positive, which isn't perfect, but it's a whole lot better than that. And there's the paper which... These sort of problems, which I talked about, they don't just apply to FST and to AA until I removed it. Um, the dependence on local variation is for anything which is a variance partition, that's a very, very strong possibility that it has that dependence. The RDA, I don't know this for sure, but I know that it's based on a regression-based partition of variation, which is also what FST is based on, really, a partition of variation. And so I would strongly suspect that RDA has that same problem that I've just shown you for FST. So. 
basically, as Arthur said, more of it was on the meth methods of pro problems probably, but you do experiments with simulation data to find what's going to work despite that. And you also preferably use methods which have some um, algebra behind them, connecting them to the underlying population genetics so that you can see, oh, that's not going right and so forth. So that's it. Thanks. <laughs> Any questions? No, good. Oh, yes. I haven't had a look, but is the mutual information stuff implemented in Dart R? Yes, the Shannon for within the population, the equivalent of the expected heterozygosity, or but in the a different scale of the Hill equations. Um, is available in data and mutual information is also available in data. They're also both, that's, that's why those are up there, they're both available in Genelix as well, if you've got data that will fit into that. Um, Chow and Chow is a doyen of diversity statistics. She mainly deals with species diversity, but you can often um, wangle her programs to work on genetic data as well. She's got extraordinary citation numbers from all this. Um, and she might be prepared to help you if you twist her arm. She's a very nice cooperative person. Um, any other questions? GL diversity. Ben just said is where you can get it. The papers, one thing I should point out is that, it's, I suppose with anything new, some of the papers that have used this, there's about 220 of them now, so I'm not fully over what all of them are doing. Um, some of them get the names reversed for some reason. They use the name for the within population one, Shannon diversity for the between population one and vice versa. So just watch it. Mm -hmm.